Your ex-girlfriend has desecrated the grave of a witch, and you've been caught in a crossfire. You and your friends are marked for death, and she won't stop sending her undead henchmen until we're all in the ground. There's no escaping from this evil witch and her bloodthirsty murder ghosts. What do you do? I'll be going over every mistake made, what you should do, and how to ultimately beat the undead killers in Fear Street Part 1. We open with Heather finishing up her late night shift at Shadyside Mall. She's about to lock up when the dude working in the ahem, <clears throat> adult novelty shop across the hall gives her a call. He surprises her with its Tinder date, and they separate to go lock up, but when she sees a book fall out of its shelf, we can tell that something isn't right here. Alright, books are falling off shelves on their own, and I'd be seriously freaked out. This girl's got to stop falling for these obvious distractions, because if we live in a town that's known for the most murders, we need to be incredibly cautious. She sees his spilt drink along with some blood, and turns around to get stabbed by this skull guy, with the book she's carrying barely blocking the blade. When it takes you six full seconds to see blood on the floor and not immediately run away, natural selection is calling out. She literally just stands there. Just run! She manages to slip under some mall fencing and hides in Ryan's adult shop. She does the right thing and calls 911, but isn't too quiet about it and gets seen by the attacker. Okay, when humans are in stressful situations like this, we've got three responses, fight, flight, or freeze. Choose the wrong option and we're dead. We have to get a weapon to defend ourselves, but since we're in a shop where everything is rubber and silicone, our best chance is to flee. Hopefully this girl is a top track runner. He's armed and looking to shank us, so I wouldn't be sticking around. If we were to stay, we would want to keep him in our line of sight, stay hidden, and wait for help to arrive. It's only a matter of time, so keeping store shelves as barriers between us would keep us from getting stabbed. Unfortunately, she does none of these things, and he grabs her from behind and she gets sliced across the stomach. Escape is no longer an option, and it's because she didn't think quickly enough. There's no way we'll be able to outrun this guy, and now she has to fight. She distracts him with a blow-up doll and gets to jump on him, smacking him across the head with a lava lamp, then running away. Alright, this is a classic horror trope, and we shouldn't fall for it. This killer is down, and we gotta hit him again. He was about to kill us, and we've got every right to defend ourselves. All she has to do is smack him over the head, take his knife, and tie him up with one of the hundreds of fuzzy handcuffs on the wall. It couldn't be more perfect. But instead, she just runs away while having a stab wound and gets easily caught and backstabbed by the killer. They get into a struggle and it's revealed to be Ryan. Pleading for her life, he's about to go for round two when the officer comes in too late with a shot to the head. And with that, they're both gone. She had so many chances to live, and she didn't take any of them. Now we're moving on quick to our main characters. This kid is Josh, and he's training for a prosperous career as an OnlyFans subscriber, when he brings up a conspiracy theory to his queen that all the murders at the mall were the work of an ancient witch named Sarah Fear. Dina here brushes it off as a fairy tale, but little does she know, it's going to cost her everything. The entire school is buzzing with the witch fantasy. There's writing on the bathroom doors, some creepy kid whips out a shank and carves R.I.P. into Heather's locker, and a crazy guy is dragging a Heather doll through the hallway. Okay, these are all signs that you should leave your school. This town is the murder capital for teens, and if I'm a teen, that means I'm on the endangered species list and should get the hell out of there. Her friends Simon and Kate, who happen to be hardcore drug dealers, Encourage her to go to the band assembly across town so she can give a gift to her ex, Sam. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather ship it or burn it instead. I'm not going across town just to give something to my ex-girlfriend, and it makes it clear that you haven't moved on. It's cold, but at least a murder witch wouldn't be after me. We pass by a sign, and we can see that this town was founded in 1666. Now, I'm not superstitious, but a small bit of stitches left in me, coupled with the fact that I'm a teenager and this town is known for murdered teens, is enough for me to book a one-way ticket to Canada. If you ever see huge glaring red flags like this, it's time to move away as far as possible and never look back. 
They're going to Sunnyvale, the rich neighbor to Shadyside, and an assembly with the local school. When Dina sees her ex-girlfriend, has moved on to a new guy. Then we get some good old-fashioned heated Netflix romance drama. Apparently, Dina dumped her after Samantha moved away. It's clear that Dina hasn't fully moved on and is still stuck on her ex. She's emotionally compromised, which will cloud her judgment, and she won't be prepared for what's coming. It's the bus ride back, and Kate is riling up all the guys from Shadyside. They're all too busy clamoring when a car of Sunnyvalers pull up behind them in skull masks and start throwing alcohol, and the Shadysiders are about to clap back with an entire cooler on their car when Dina's nose starts bleeding and she drops the cooler, sending Sam's car into a crash. The bus pulls over when Sam gets hit with the same nosebleed, unknowingly touching some cursed ground and having a creepy vision of witchcraft and satanic imagery. Okay, when people are getting nosebleeds and satanic visions, we need to take a step back and consider moving away as far as possible. Considering the lore of this town, witchcraft could definitely be at play. There's no earthly cure for it, the police won't help, and I haven't been to church in seven years. The police question them when Sam's current beau whispers to Dina that he's gonna kill her giving us yet another reason to move far away from this town. He's just threatened our lives, and that could be charged as a felony. Since it's super convenient, and there's cops right next to us, I would seriously consider tattling on him, just to get him off our backs. She's woken by her brother, and decides to check in with Samantha at the hospital, when the door rings. She goes to the door, and no one's there. Then, she looks out, and sees some creep just standing across the street. Now, I don't know about you, but this is enough for me to sleep with a gun tonight. If some guy is stalking you like this, you need to call the cops and be ready to defend yourself. She thinks it's just Sam's boyfriend, but when she sees him armed with the knife again in the kitchen window, she's had enough and whips out a steak knife to go 1v1 this guy. Okay, she's a lot smaller than this creep, so she needs to stack the deck in her favor. She has the right to defend her brother and her property, so if a guy is just standing out there, menacingly, then she should call the cops, grab the gun out, and make sure she keeps track of exactly where he is. We flash over to Kate, who's neighbors with Dina, and someone's breaking into her house. He's just standing there, stroking the shirt with Sam's blood on it. Kate foolishly calls out to him, alerting him to her presence, and he turns around menacingly. Okay, now he's in the house, and we have every right to shoot this guy. Shadyside is a real place in Pennsylvania, and in Pennsylvania, breaking and entering is a second degree felony, with penalties up to 10 years in prison and a $25,000 fine, not to mention the threatening with the deadly weapon and stalking. This has gone too far for it to be a prank anymore, so what we need to do is go to the cops, file charges, and get a restraining order. Instead, they let the felony slide and decide to confront Sam about her boyfriend's antics. but. When she claims that he's been with her in the hospital all night, we can tell that something's not right. All right, something is seriously wrong here. I would probably think she's lying to save her boyfriend's reputation, but if she isn't, then something even worse is at play here. Dina and Sam really get into it when Peter starts gurgling, the same skeleton from earlier driving a knife right through his back. At this moment, there really wasn't anything Peter could have done. If he'd had any situational awareness, he might have heard the killer shuffling around and been able to throw Dina at him. The pair run past their friends when they hide in the receptionist area, discovering that the killer had already gotten to her and he straight up murders Betty. Dina and the killer get into a struggle when his mask falls off and it looks like the corpse of the kid from the beginning. We're either on some serious drugs or this is something supernatural. Whatever the case, this guy is trying to kill us and we need the cops to step in. The whole group goes to the cops, and they stupidly assume that a detective will believe that a corpse is going around killing people, and obviously, the cops don't believe them. If it were me, I'd just say it was a killer. That would at least be believable, and he left a whole pile of evidence back at the hospital, getting us into protective custody and sending in the SWAT team to go and secure it is our best bet. From this point on, each and every one of us needs to invest in GoPro cameras to document everything we see. Our word is just not enough these days, and even then, they could claim it's doctored. 
We need proof of everything we're saying, because once the world is aware of this evil witch and her lackeys, there's nowhere they'll be able to hide. But since this is 1994, we'll have to rely on some digital cameras instead. Expectedly, the cops throw them out, when we flash to Simon, who's just doing his business on a public street, when he hears a creepy girl singing an old-timey sounding song, and decides to go right up to her, when he slices his leg with a razor blade. Unfortunately for Simon, she's into choking, goes for his throat, and is about to finish him off when Dina shoots her three times in the chest with surprisingly fantastic aim. They all escape, and it's clear that bullets won't stop these undead killers. If it weren't for Dina, Simon would be an absolute goner. Too many people in this movie fall for obvious distractions, and it's going to cost them their lives. In real life, someone who's never fired a handgun like Dina wouldn't be able to hit a shot from that far. The easiest way to beat this would be to not approach the kneeling girl who's singing unsettling tunes in the middle of the street and just walk away. Though Simon does give his reasoning for this later on. I know, she, just, I know, she was hot! I a very well thought out argument. I'm sure he'll get out of this movie relatively unscathed. The group gets back to Dina's house when they figure out it's Sarah Fear, who possesses people and forces them to kill. Nothing like immense trauma and psycho killers coming after you to bring couples together. Rather than digital cameras, they wear little minor headlamps, bring no weapons or protective gear, and go back to where the car crashed. It turns out, by touching the witch's gravesite, Sam inadvertently desecrated her unreasonably shallow grave, and that really pissed her off. They forgot to bring shovels and pathetically attempt to bury her bones in a varsity jacket when Sam's nose starts to bleed again. It's quiet, when all of a sudden, an angry Canadian comes after them, flannel and all. They barely escape in the ambulance when they realize that Sam is the one who disturbed the grave and the killers are after her and her blood, which got on Dina's shoes and Simon's shirt. Okay, it's all adding up. Now that we know this, the next logical thing to do is dump Sam on the side of the road, along with all our bloody clothes. It's cruel, but Dina hated her just a couple hours ago, so it shouldn't be too hard. She can't let go of her past feelings, and it's going to cost the group their lives. Cop gets to the hospital, and doesn't even look surprised at the bloodbath of evidence. Just disappointed. The group needs to use the buddy system, and shouldn't go to dark, unlit areas at all. Carrying a weapon, and getting a digital camera to gather evidence is crucial to their survival. Instead of following our advice, literally everybody except Simon gets hot and heavy, with vicious killers coming after them. Then we get a Home Alone trap setup montage where they mix Sam's blood with water, flood the bathroom with combustible methanol, and then leave her in the bathroom as bait. And if they're lucky, the school won't file vandalism charges. It'd be much better to do this in a public place where there's adults as witnesses. The police station would be a good place to do this because then they'll believe our insane story. They use Sam's diluted blood to lure all three killers towards Sam, with them walking right past the group, locking them in the bathroom, and having Sam escape through a vent. Then, the kids light the fuel they left in the bathroom, and the monsters explode into black goop. It seems like it's finally over, when one of the killers starts to reform. Okay, now we know these things can't be killed, and it's game over. Throwing Sam under the bus is our only option, or else more people are going to die. Kate puts it best. We put Sam in the hall, we end this now. I'm starting to really like this Kate girl. She's thinking rationally about how to save everybody but Sam, while Dina is still attached to her ex. She's too emotional and isn't thinking about the well-being of the group. Even Sam agrees, and the group locks her out with the killers coming right for her. This entire film is about to come to a gruesome end, when Josh looks at a newspaper and figures out that there was a girl 16 years ago who had visions and lived. The group clings on to Hope and quickly brings Sam back in and they try to call that girl from 16 years ago up, but get hit with the answering machine while Simon barricades the door and no one else helps him. This is a high stress situation and people aren't thinking straight but if there's just one scrawny teenage boy standing between us and imminent death, 
we gotta throw more bodies at that door. Instead of figuring it all out in this death trap of a classroom, we should just rip the page out of the phone book, get the important newspapers, and jump out of the window now. They do more research and find out that the girl who lived had clinically died, then came back when given CPR. Which is just some groundbreaking Final Destination sh If all we need to do is clinically kill her, then shock her back to life, then we should go over the best options. In the film, Simon uses his non-existent PhD to prescribe some hardcore drugs for her to take, when instead they should take her to the ambulance and use the defibrillator to stop her heart, leave her dead for no more than two minutes, after which lack of blood flow will cause brain damage and then shock her back to life. It's risky, but it's better than everyone getting stabbed to death by a bunch of goo monsters. To buy her the time she needs to overdose then come back, the entire group paints themselves in her blood then volunteers as meat shields, which is a really bad idea. At the very least, I would just soak a rag or t-shirt in the blood so it's not just stuck on my skin like this. That way, I'd be able to throw it in the opposite direction in case I got cornered. Sam didn't really care about her boyfriend who died just hours ago because she and Dina are already planning on moving on fast. The most unrealistic part of this whole movie is that she takes a handful of Tic Tacs and swallows them without water. Using pills to clinically kill this girl is going to be the worst mistake this group makes. With this plan, she needs to take three whole handfuls of pills with no water. Medications can take up to 30 minutes to dissolve, which is just time we don't have. Kate picks up some hairspray off the shelf, and Simon here picks up an X-Acto knife to defend himself, which is just plain pointless. We already blew them up and shot them, and it didn't do shit. If it were me, I'd be washing Sam's blood off of me and making immediate exit plans. They might hate us for it, but hey, I'd rather be hated by two high schoolers than be cut up like a Subway sandwich. Predictably, Sam vomits up the pills, and Dina makes one last ditch effort to save her. The skeleton guy almost catches them, but Kate lights him on fire with the hairspray and lets them get away. Meanwhile, the hot killer's on Simon, and despite his inner conflict, he senses her behind him and sticks her in the jugular. At this point, these two have already done enough and put themselves in too much danger. It's time to ditch Dina and Sam, because it's clear that Dina's willing to sacrifice us for Sam. They fail to do this, and it will cost them everything. Now Skeletor's after Kate, and she's got no chance. She can't overpower this guy, so she has to get away. But he's too close to outrun, and he slams her face into a cake and stabs her in the gut. Talk about rough stuff. Then he shoves her head through a bread slicer, and there's nothing she can do. Kate had so many chances to get away, and she didn't take any of them. By saving Dina and Sam, she put a target on her own back and it's the biggest mistake of her life. Josh and Simon come across the body, and they both freeze. Luckily for Josh, Simon's the one who gets axed by the angry Canadian. Okay, Josh is now out of meat shields, and it's time to get out of the store. The girl you're crushing on is dead, and you're about to be next. Instead of running to his sister, he should be taking off his shirt with Sam's blood on it, throwing it away from him, and making a break for it. He completely ignores our advice, and leads them right to Dina. But just as he's about to be finished off by the spooky scary skeleton, Sam finally drowns, and the apparitions disappear. Dina drags her out, and they try to resuscitate her. Dina takes seven EpiPens to try and bring her back, and then just waits there for a whole ten minutes before it's starting CPR. A ton of people have already died because of this chick, so Dina using seven times more adrenaline than she should is just plain foolish. They're finally able to revive her, and it seems like it's all over. Later, the police interview them and they blame it all on the broken glass and the fact that Simon and Kate are druggies. The crime scene won't support this at all, but the police are so incompetent in this movie that they'll let two counts of murder slide. They're back at Dina's house, and they don't seem too shaken up by the fact that two of their close friends died that very same day. When suddenly, Dina gets a call from the girl who survived the witch 16 years ago. She claims it's not over when the witch possesses Sam and turns her into a psychotic, bloodthirsty killer, making her stab Dina with a wooden stake. They get into a brutal fight, and Dina manages to tie her up with the world's longest phone cable. Okay, it seems like Kate and Simon died for nothing, and it was all so we could get a few extra hours with our future ex-girlfriend. Like I said before, I haven't been to church in seven years, 
so there's no way we'll be able to fix this on our own. We could get her involuntarily admitted to a psychiatric ward and blame all the murders on her. What are your thoughts? Would you survive Fear Street? Let me know if a comment down below. Thanks for watching this video, leave a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one.